may be seated. Amen. Please uh, remain standing for the reading of the word. Sorry. <laughs> Please take your Bibles with me, uh, if you can remain standing as we read the Word of God together. We find ourselves in Romans chapter 7, Romans chapter 7, verses 1 through 6. Romans chapter 7, verses 1 through 6. As you know, we've been going through the book of Romans and learning the benefits and the blessings of being redeemed and born again. We have been joined to Christ. We have been justified uh, by faith alone in Christ alone. And, uh, and so we're learning now in chapter 7 that we also have freedom, freedom from the curse of sin, but also freedom from the law. Let's read Romans chapter 7, verses 1 through 6 together, and it reads this way. Romans chapter 7, verse 1 says, Or do you not know, brethren, that I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law has jurisdiction over a person as long as he lives? For the married woman is bound by law to her husband while he is living, but if her husband dies, she is released from the law concerning the husband. So then, if while her husband is living, she is joined to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law, so that she is not an adulteress, though she is joined to another man. Therefore, my brethren, you also were made to die to the law through the body of Christ, so that you might be joined to another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit for God. For while we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in the members of our body to bear fruit for death." But now we have been released from the law, having died to that by which we were bound, so that we serve a newness of the Spirit and not an oldness of the letter. Let's pray. Dear Father, thank you so much for your precious word. Father, we are learning that we have this freedom now. We have not only been set free from the power and penalty of sin, we have been set free also from the penalty of the law. And we are not under the Mosaic law, but we are now under grace. We ask now for your grace upon us, dear Father. I ask for mercy. I pray for clarity, O Lord, in thought and in speech, and also for your people that they may receive your word with fear and trembling, for this is the word of God. And now, Father, we beseech you for your grace and mercy. We ask you to speak to every heart. And Lord, if there's one soul that has uh, never put their trust in Christ as Savior, and Lord, we ask for salvation. Bless us, we pray, and we ask all these things, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. And so you've been learning all these wonderful things about justification, about um, being joined to Christ now as uh, by God's grace through faith when we trusted in Christ something happened didn't it something happened when someone shared the gospel with you and you opened your heart to the gospel message there was a transaction so to speak right what happened is your sin was nailed to the cross and the righteousness of Christ was was now uh, imputed upon you in the sense we're clothed in the righteousness of Christ. And now when the Father sees you who are redeemed, he sees the righteousness of his Son. And, and we learn then that we are justified, even though we have sinned against the Lord, we have been forgiven and we are saved. We also learn that we have been joined to Christ, not only in his death and his burial, but in the newness of life through his resurrection. So, beloved, we have to think that we have died to sin. That doesn't mean that, um, that we live sinless lives. We're still battling sin. It's still a, a force and a power, but we no longer have to yield to it. We can say no to sin, and we have a, a great high priest that helps us during the time of temptation. This morning, we're going to look at verses 1 through 6, and I've titled this, Freedom to Serve God. We have been freed. And so we see here in verses 1 to 3, you have your outlines there in the bulletins. In verses 1 to 3, Paul gives us the analogy, the analogy of a, of a man and woman who are married. 
And then he, he began to share with us that we need to acknowledge this, this new marriage, this we have been married to Christ, so to speak. And now what are, what are we to do with that? We live a new life. Now, let's look at the analogy first, and I want you to understand something. In verses 1 to 3, this is not an expository passage to basically talk, talk to us about marriage and divorce and remarriage. This is an analogy, okay? If you want to talk about those things, there's other passages that do that in the book of Matthew, and also we see in 1 Corinthians 7. So we have to understand that this is an analogy, and, and Paul is making one point. And the point is this, that the law is for the living, okay? The law is for the living. Look at verses 1 to 3. And you can tell that he's talking to those Jewish people that have a hard time with grace. A lot of people have a hard time with grace, that were saved by God's grace through faith because they, they believe that somehow they need to uh, work for their salvation, so Paul wants to show them that they're making a transition. Many of the Jews that lived in that day, they are making that transition from the Old Testament covenant, the Mosaic covenant, into the new covenant of grace in Christ. Look at chapter 7, verse 1. Or do you not know, brethren, for I'm speaking to those who know the law, that the law has jurisdiction over a person as long as he lives. Now, when was the last time you saw a police officer go and give a ticket to a man who had passed away? He's not going to do that, right? And uh, MacArthur makes the point when, uh, and it kind of shows you, the, you know, his age, when, when it came to uh, Oswald, right, the one that assassinated Kennedy, um, they, didn't have a, um, they didn't have a trial for him. Do you remember why? Why did they have a, a, a trial for Lee, uh, Lee Oswald? I can't remember his full name. Lee Harvey, you guys remember. Why did they have a trial for him? He was dead. They don't have a trial for dead people. The law is not for dead people. The law is for those who are living. And so Paul is making this point. Look, here's the law. And the law has jurisdiction for on a person as long as they're alive. And then he gives the analogy for a married woman is bound by law. Remember, this is an axiomatic truth. This is a general truth. He could be talking about Grecian law. He could be talking about Roman law or even the law, uh, the, the Hebrew law. This is a general truth. For the married woman is bound by law to her husband while he is living. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law concerning the husband. Real simple, right? It, that it's as long as he lives. Look at verse 3. So then, if while her husband is living, she is joined to another man, that's called a bigamist, right? You can't do that. You have people married to several people, like, that's illegal. Not only a bigamist, but an adulterer. So then, if while her husband is living, she is joined to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies... She is free from the law so that she is not an adulteress, though she is joined to another man. And what's the analogy? The law is, only has jurisdiction over the living. Really important. So we see then that a man and a wife are bound for life as long as they are alive. Again, this is a general truth here. When one dies... The covenant, in a sense, is completed, isn't it? Because remember, when you take those vows, it's till death do us part. And the vow is fulfilled. I want you to understand that in Christ, okay, in Christ, the perfect fulfillment of the law, the perfect, the perfect law of God is fulfilled in Christ's perfect life. Do you understand that? The law of God is perfectly fulfilled in Christ. And because we are joined to Christ, we have fulfilled the law. Isn't that interesting? Not only that, but in Christ's death, in Christ's death, God's perfect justice is satisfied. When Jesus said to Talisai, it is finished, that's exactly what he meant. 
So being the perfect, holy, divine Lamb of God, when He died, God's justice was satisfied. Jesus is what they call our propitiation. He satisfies God's perfect justice. But not only His justice, but even His perfect righteousness through His life. Isn't that amazing? And that's applied to us, who by God's grace and through faith... We not only have our sins cleansed and we're justified, but even the perfect righteousness of Christ is applied to us. That's an amazing thing, isn't it? And so we see then, beloved, that, that the analogy here is between a man and a woman, and it's as long as they live. But if one dies, they no longer have that obligation. It's been fulfilled. Go with me to Luke 20. We see that the Sadducees had this wrong. And by the way, there are religions that believe that you're still married. Once you're married here, you're still married in heaven. No, I don't think so. Luke chapter 20, go with me there. And I know that might make some of you sad, but I'm sorry. I remember hearing, a, a, I was talking to a, a pastor friend of mine, and his wife says, we're not going to be married in heaven. She's like, that makes me sad. Like, well, we're married to the Lord. <laughs> Doesn't mean we stop loving each other. Uh, Luke chapter 20, look at verse 27. Remember this, when the Sadducees, by the way, who do not believe in the resurrection, are questioning Jesus about the resurrection, and they're using a, a, a ridiculous argument of a woman that was married to seven men. Remember that? And we learn here that they did not know the Word of God. And so Jesus makes a correction. And Luke chapter 20, verse 27 says, Now there, were, uh, there came to him some Sadducees who say that there is no resurrection. And they questioned him, saying, Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies having a wife and he is childless, his brother should marry the wife and raise up children to his brother. That's found in Deuteronomy 25, verse 5, by the way. Now, there were seven brothers, and the, the first took a wife and, and, and died childless, and, and the second, and the third married her. In the same way, all seven died, leaving no children. And here comes the ridiculousness, and it just shows their ignorance of the Scripture. Finally, the woman died also in the resurrection. Therefore, which one's wife will she be? For all seven had married her. How ridiculous is that? You see, that's an earthly thing, isn't it? To be married to one another. It's wonderful that we, we have that. But Jesus makes it very clear to them. Verse 34, Jesus said, The sons of this age marry and are given in marriage. But those who are considered worthy to attain to that age and the resurrection from the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage. For they cannot even die anymore because they are like angels and are sons of God, being sons of the resurrection. And so we see here that Jesus makes that correction. Basically, he's just calling out their ignorance. When it comes to when, when we pass away and we, we are resurrected and we be, we're with the Lord, these earthly ties are not what they used to be, Right? I'm no longer, you know, we have sons and daughters, we have mothers, and I think all that kind of disappears now. We become saints or we're before the Lord, but to be married, that's an earthly thing, right? It's to raise up godly offspring. And, and so we learn here that, that even these Sadducees, and as I mentioned before, there's false religion that say you're still married when you die. It's like for some people, that would be a curse, right? <laughs> And so we see here then that, that Paul is making this analogy that, that once one of, the, one of them dies, they're released from the law. And he's trying to make that analogy, and you can tell it has a Jewish flavor to it. Can you tell that? Because you see that there's still people, still people from Israel, they're still believing, they're still under the covenant, they're still under the Mosaic law. And they believe if, if you're saying, Paul, that we're no longer under law, then that's, you're giving the people license to sin. What's going to restrain people? You know what's going to restrain people? The new birth. You are born again. 
You are a new creation. You have a different heart. And so we have to understand that Paul is addressing these people who, who believe that, that uh, we are still under law. And, as you know, a lot of people that Paul dealt with were Judaizers who believed that we still had to apply the law of Moses. Now, you have to understand nine of the Ten Commandments are still repeated in the New Testament. We call that the moral law. We're talking about the whole covenant he, that God made on Mount Sinai with the children of Israel. It wasn't just the moral law. It was the, what else? It was the uh, civil law and the ceremonial laws, right? Sacrificing animals and all of that. And so we see here that Paul is saying, look, it's been done away with. In Christ, we have died. And so we have to understand that. Let's look at another passage here. Go with me to Galatians chapter 3. Another term for the law would be a tutor, isn't it? Galatians chapter 3, verse 19. We have, we have to understand that the law is good, by the way. It's been given to us by God. It's perfect, but we're no longer under that covenant, the Mosaic covenant. We are in a new covenant, a covenant of grace. Galatians chapter 3, verse 19, what does it say here? Paul says, in addressing the Galatians, because the Judaizers had invaded the southern part of Galatia, many churches there are telling them they need to be circumcised and they need to follow the law of Moses. And, you know, then you can, you can trust in Jesus and all of that put together is your salvation. Beloved, remember that salvation is by God's grace alone, faith alone, and who? In Christ alone. Please understand that. And so we see here then in Galatians chapter 3, verse 19, Paul writes, why the law then? It was added because of transgressions. Remember that Romans says that with the law is the knowledge of sin. The law does not wash away your sin. The law, through the law, no flesh shall be justified. With the law is a knowledge of sin. So why the law? It was added because of transgressions, having been ordained through angels by the agency of the mediator until the seed would come to whom the promise had been made. Now a mediator is not for one party only, whereas God is only one. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? No. What promises is he talking about? The promise that God gave to Abraham, that through his seed, all the families of the earth will be blessed. The promises are separated from the law. The promises are by faith. Verse 21. Is a law then contrary to the promises of God? May it never be. For if a law had been given which was able to impart life, then righteousness would indeed have been based on the law. But the law can do that. The law cannot give you eternal life. The law cannot wash away your sins. It can't do that. The law exposes our sin. It's like a mirror, right? And the purpose of the law is to show man his sinfulness and hopefully leads him to repentance in a Savior. Look at verse 22. But the Scripture was, has shut up everyone under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. But before faith came, we were kept in custody under the law, being shut up to the faith which was later to be revealed. Therefore, the law has become what? Our tutor. In the sense, the law shows us our sin, and in the sense, the law takes us by the hand and says, I can't save you, but I'm going to take you to someone that can save you. It's kind of like, you know, it's that tutor, right? Therefore, the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ. Think about this. Every time you see Jesus, when someone says, good teacher, as the uh, rich young ruler says, what one thing must I do to be saved? Remember that? Remember that? He comes to him, good teacher, what one thing must I do to be saved? I've done all these wonderful things, but I must be lacking somewhere. Show me. You know, Jesus could have simply said, hey, just believe in me. But that's not what Jesus said. Why? Because a man needed to face his sin. Remember Jesus says, what does the law say? 
You see, beloved, we have to understand that there has to be an understanding that we are sinners and we have broken God's law. And because we have broken God's law, there has to be a sacrifice. And un until there's a sacrifice, we cannot, we cannot come to the Father. That's what Jesus says. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. So he points to the law. And when you look at the law, Jesus began to, to share with them the first part of the Decalogue, or second part of the Decalogue, remember? Honor your father and mother. And, and he says, do not steal. And he began to share with them. And the young ruler, remember what he said? All these things I kept from my childhood. Wow. Not only was this guy blinded, but he was self-righteous. Beloved, Jesus came to save the self-righteous. Jesus came to save sinners. What this young man needed to see is himself as a sinner. There's nobody that has perfectly kept the law of God. Nobody except Christ. And so he says to Jesus, all these I kept from my childhood. So you see a sense of self-righteousness. So what does Jesus do? He goes for the jugular, doesn't he? This man was rich, and his God was money. And Jesus says, okay, you want to be perfect? Go take all that you have and sell it and give the proceeds to the poor, and then you come and follow me. What happened? He walked away sad, didn't he? He walked away sad. He was, holy, he was, he, he was willing to hold on to the temporal and lose the eternal. We shall have profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his own soul. And so, beloved, we have to see this, that, that the law is a tutor. The law can't save us. And it's just, I think it seems so simple to him. And a lot of people think it's so simple. Beloved, I want you to understand when it comes to salvation and the forgiveness of God, yes, it is a gift of God, but friend, it isn't cheap. It costs the very blood of the Lamb of God. Please understand that. And so we see here then, in verse 24, the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we no longer are under the tutor. See that? You remember we talked about the husband? That you may be joined to another. Look at verse 26. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you were baptized into Christ, having clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. And he's talking about spiritually speaking, isn't he? Because physically, there are differences, and there are roles they have to play. Spiritually speaking, there are no Jews or Greeks. Slave or free. Neither male or female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. In other words... These are the elect, aren't they? And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants, heirs according to the promise. And so it's so important that we understand this, that there's a transition, just like there was a transition here, from the tutor to the Savior. That's what the, that's what the law does. You see, what should have happened with that rich young ruler, he should have fallen on his face and said, Lord, have mercy upon me. I have broken every one of these commandments. I need mercy. That means he needs a savior, beloved. That's what the law shows us. The law shows us we need a savior. We need a redeemer. We can't save ourselves. We've broken God's law. We deserve God's wrath. And that's what Christ took upon himself. The wrath of God, didn't he? And so, beloved, we see then that, that uh, Paul is showing there's a transition now from uh, being set free from one thing, here the law, and now being married to Christ. Look at Romans chapter 10. Go back with me. Romans chapter 10. This is Paul's heart. You guys remember this? Paul is so broken for his people. He loves him so much. It's like many of you love your children, love your loved ones. You want them to be saved. You can see Paul sharing his heart with us. 
In Romans chapter 10, verse 1, Brethren, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for them, talking about Israel, is for their salvation. For I testify about them that they have a zeal for God. They're religious, but not in accordance with knowledge. For not knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. You see, the righteousness of God has to be imputed, doesn't it? It is a gift of God by His grace through faith. We can't earn it ourselves. And that's what they don't understand. They thought that they can earn it by keeping the law. Look at verse 4. For Christ is what? See the word end? It can also be translated goal, the goal. For Christ is the goal of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. You see, that's the tutor, isn't it? The law leads us to Christ. What's the goal of the law? First, it shows us our sin, but it leads us to a Savior, a Redeemer, to the Lamb of God, right? And so we see that Christ is the end of the law. So now that we have come to Christ and put our trust in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, we're no longer under the penalty of the law or under the law at all. And so we have to understand this. Just like we are no longer under the penalty of sin, and yet we, we still follow God's word, we, we have, again, we still have the moral law, but I want you to understand here that he's talking about the Mosaic law. And so, beloved, now when it comes to keeping God's commandments, go with me to 1 John. I want you to see this, okay? I want you to see this. What happens when we are born again and we are saved, God gives us a new heart, doesn't he? He gives us a new heart. I remember uh, a story that I read as you turn to 1 John chapter 5 of a woman that was married to a man that was really harsh. And this man was really strict on her. And her marriage became a, a type of an oppression. And this man was real strict. He wanted her to do things a certain way, cook his meal a certain way, iron his clothes, do all these things in a very strict and stringent way. And, and she did all of these things. And, and finally, her husband died. And she met a wonderful man, a gracious, loving, patient man. And he didn't give her rules. That first husband gave her a, a, a list of rules he wanted her to follow. This next man that she married that loved her and she loved him, there were no rules. All he wanted was for her to love him. And, and one day, she was ironing his clothes in the morning, very joyful. She found the list of rules from her first husband. And she looked at the list of rules that he wanted for her to do. And she remembers how burdened she was and how oppressed she was. But now with her husband, her new husband, she looked at this, those rules and guess what? She was automatically doing the, the list of rules without feeling oppression. She did it from her heart. She did it joyfully because she loved her husband. And the commandments or those Rules no longer were a burden to her. Isn't that amazing? Because she had a change of heart. And beloved, we see this then. That's what God does for us. He gives us a change of heart. We are a new creation. 1 John chapter 4, look at verses 1 through 4. 1 John chapter, chapter 5, I'm sorry, verses 1 through 4. 1 John chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and whoever loves a father loves a child born of him. In other words, if you truly are born again Christian, you, you're going to love God's people. By this we know that we love the ch children of God when we love God and observe his commandments. Real simple. How do you know if we love God? Are we in obeying him? That, shares, that shows us, shows God and ourselves that we love him. Verse 3, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. And look at verse 3. And his commandments are what? They're not burdensome. 
Isn't that amazing? You know why? Because you want to obey God. It reminds me of Jacob. Remember Jacob went to his, his uh, uncle Laban and, uh, and he was going to work for his uncle Laban. And his uncle Laban says, well, what should I pay you? You know, I can't just have you work for free. What can I pay you? He goes, well, you know what, Uncle Laban, I'll work for you for seven years for your daughter, Rachel. This little sneak. Your daughter, Rachel. And he goes, oh, I might as well give her to you. And if you remember reading the story, seven years, the Bible says it seemed like just a few days. For Je he was so in love with Rachel. It was like a few days. You see, that's what it's like when you're saved and you're born again. When you read God's commandments, when you read his word, you're like, oh, I love to do that. Love God? Yeah. Love my neighbor? Love my Christians? Husbands, love your wives? I want to do that. That's where my heart is. You see, God changes us from the inside out, and his commandments are not burdensome to us. Isn't that amazing? And so we see here then that the analogy here is this woman is married to a man until he dies, or until she dies, right? Because we know the law does not die, and they're set free that they may marry another. And beloved, that's what Paul's point is. Go back with me to Romans we have been married to somebody else. Now, many of us here are married people, and that's wonderful. I want to just tell you single people, I want you to know something, right? I want you to know this. You are married to Jesus. You are married to Christ. And you need to be faithful to Christ. So I want you to understand that. You might say, well, I'm not married. No, you are married. You're married to Jesus Christ. And, and so we need to understand that. And that's how we need to live our lives. We are married to him. And so we see here then that that's Paul's point. We are married to Christ. Go with me to Romans chapter 7, verse 4 and 5. He says, Therefore, my brethren, you also were made to die. How? We died in Christ. When Christ was crucified and buried and resurrected, we died with him. We were buried with him, and we were resurrected in him. Therefore, my brethren, you also were made to die to the law here, through the body of Christ, so that you might be joined to another. To who? Who are we joined to? To him who is raised, who is raised from the dead in order that we might bear fruit for God. So who are we joined to? We're joined to Christ. The church is called the bride of Christ. That's important. And so we have been joined to Christ. We no longer are, are in the flesh. We're no longer under any type, as he's talking to the Jewish folks there. You're no longer under this old covenant, under the Mosaic covenant. Well, you've been joined to another, and that's to Christ. Look at verse 5. For while we were in the flesh, and the word flesh there has to do with has to do with their uh, their morals, okay? Whenever you use, flesh is used in a different way. When it's used in the physical sense, it's kind of neutral. Jesus came in the flesh, that wasn't bad. But here it's talking about in the moral sense, flesh is lustful. For while you were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law we're at work in members of our body to bear fruit. What kind of fruit? For death. for death. The Bible says, for the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And so we see then that we have been purchased by Christ, by his atoning death on the cross. And we have also been joined to him through baptism. Not, not the water baptism. This is baptism of the Holy Spirit, isn't it? We have died with him. We're buried with him, resurrected with him in the newness of life so that we may do something. We may bear fruit. Well, what is fruit? What is he talking about? Well, there's two types of fruit, right? One is uh, the fruit of, 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 uh, of works. There's also fruit of an attitude. You see that in Galatians chapter 5. 
But also bearing fruit also can relate to bringing souls to Christ. And so we may bear fruit. You might say, well, which one does it mean, Pastor? I think it means all of them. We may bear fruit because bearing fruit brings glory to God. Jesus said in the book of John chapter 15, in this way my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. And I think just to put it in a nutshell, it's Christ-likeness. It's Christ-likeness. So it has to do with everything, right? With our thoughts, with our attitudes, with our actions, everything, and even bringing people to Christ. So this is the new life God has called us to. We may bear fruit of righteousness to the glory of God. Now, let's not leave, leave off the marriage uh, thing here. I want you to go back to, with me to Ephesians chapter 5. The church is the bride of Christ, isn't it? And, uh, you know, for us guys, us macho, macho guys are like, mm, I don't like being kind of called a bride, but sorry, guys. We've been joined to Christ. We're married to him. We belong to him. I like that song that, that he is mine and I am his. I like that song. Ephesians chapter 5. Look at verse 23, the analogy. Marriage, and I love to share this when I, when I give, when I uh, do a marriage. I love to share with them what the Bible says. And I'll tell you, when, uh, when I share this with those who do not know the Lord, it's kind of shocking. And yet they ask me to marry them, and it's my turn to share the gospel, and I use this passage right here. So Mario, now you know. Ephesians 5, verse 23, For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. You see, there's an order in creation, isn't there? God made Adam, and then he made Eve to be his helper. And we learn that the marriage is to follow that order of creation. The husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body, verse 24. But as a church is subject to Christ, so also the Christ, uh, excuse me, the wives ought to be to the husbands in a few things. Is that what it says? Wow, that's pretty strong language, isn't it? You might say, well, pastor, you don't know my knucklehead husband. <laughs> no, I don't. I just can tell you what the Word of God teaches. And if you obey the Word of God, God's going to bless you. Okay? I think, ladies, you, I, I think it would be very difficult, but God's grace is there for you. Verse 25, husbands, love your wives. Just as Christ has also loved the church and gave himself up for her. In other words, husbands, this is a sacrificial love. A sacrificial love. So that he might, and here's the reason, sanctify her, make her holy, right? Having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. You see what fruit looks like? It looks like holiness and blamelessness. So husbands ought to also love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. No one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church, because we are members of his body. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother, and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is great, but I am speaking with reference to Christ and the church. Nevertheless, each individual among you also is to love his own wife, even as himself, and the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. And so what a picture. Christ and the church is a picture of marriage. And beloved, let me tell you something. When you have a bad marriage, it's a bad reflection on Christ and the church. So every Christian marriage should reflect Christ and the church. And so we see this then that Paul uh, makes that 
very clear that Christ is the one that we are subject to. We are the bride now, and we need to obey the Lord in everything. So we have been purchased by Christ, his atoning death on the cross. We have been joined to him through baptism. We have died with him, were buried and resurrected, and now in him we're living this new life. Christ purchased his bride with his own blood to be holy and blameless. Over and over again, the Bible says that we've been purchased. I mean, do you really understand that? Remember, we just talked about this in chapter 6, that we are no longer slaves to sin, but now we are slaves to God. Jesus literally has purchased us. Not only has he created us, but he has purchased us again, right? He has redeemed us from the power and the penalty of sin. And so we see here then over and over again, the word of God talks about how Christ has purchased us. You thought you belonged to yourself. You don't. You, you either are a slave to sin, a child of the devil, or you are a child of God and a slave to righteousness. It's one or the other, beloved. There's no neutral ground. Go with me to 1 Peter chapter 1. And I know that it's hard because some people want to say, well, I'm neutral. I'm agnostic. Sorry, that means you're lost. You're lost. Because true salvation is to know the Lord, isn't it? It's to know the Lord. Jesus says, my sheep, he says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them. First Peter chapter 1, look at verse 13. First Peter 1. Somebody wants to... Somebody's phone's going off there. First Peter 1, through, uh, 13. What does Peter say to the Christians? These are newborn Christians, by the way, and they were scattered because of the persecution in Jerusalem. Peter says, therefore, prepare your minds for what? For action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the earth. Is that what it says? Or on your bank account. What does it say? <laughs> Keep your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Where is my hope and my dreams? They're in Christ. He is my hope. I can't wait to be with him. Now, this life is great, right? I mean, it has its ups and downs. Sometimes it's not so great. But my hopes and dreams are in Christ. It doesn't matter what's going on here. If you're, if you're going through bad things here, understand your hope is in, in the Lord. And he says to them, because they were being persecuted, he says, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Why? Because they're going through persecution. They're probably losing hope. As obedient children, do not become conformed to the former lust which were yours in your ignorance. You guys live like there was no God. But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in your behavior because it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. God's called us to holiness, beloved. If you address as father, the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth. And beloved, it's going to be short. Knowing that you were not redeemed with what? With perishable things like silver or gold from your feudal way of life inherited from your forefathers. But what were we purchased with? We were redeemed with the precious blood as a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. For he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. So... We belong to Christ, first of all, because he made us, he created us, but even more because he redeemed us with his blood. Really important, 
Really important. And so, beloved, understand that we are the Lord's to the fullest, right? So this is even more profound than just marriage. Not only did Christ, uh, are we married to Christ, but Christ himself died atoning for our sin. And so it's much more deeper than that, isn't it? And so we have been united with Christ by faith. It says that in Romans 6. Go back with me Romans 6. We just went over that a couple of weeks ago. We have been united with Christ. And you might say, well, I don't feel any different. It, friends, it doesn't go by feelings. It goes by what God says in the Word, right? And so it's important that we understand this because sometimes we want to wait for feelings. You know, it's like a person says, well, I don't feel like obeying. Well, friend, let me tell you, when God just says obey, you just do it, right? You don't wait for the feelings to come upon you. In Romans chapter 6, verse 3, this is so important. We must believe this because this is the word of God. Romans chapter 6, verse 3 says this. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. We, were we died with him, we were buried with him, and we were resurrected with him. We have this new life now. Look at verse 6. Knowing this, that our old self... And you know what you're talking about. The old fleshly self was crucified with him, as Paul says, right, in Galatians. Our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away. The word done away there means powerless, rendered powerless. So that we would no longer be slaves to sin. We're going to be tempted. Don't get me wrong. We're going to be tempted. Temptation itself is not sin, but sin's going to come knocking at your door. And you know what? You don't have to submit to it. Before you didn't have a choice, right? Before you didn't have a choice, it just drag you by your hair. Say, ah, you're coming with me. But now you're like, I don't have to go with you. I don't have to submit to you. I've been set free. But the temptation is there. That's when we pray and ask for God's grace. So we see then that the power of sin has been done away with. Verse 7, For he who has died is free from sin. Now if we have died, and we have, with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, and we will. Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Christ died once for all, the perfect Lamb of God. He is our perfect high priest right? The, the high priest back in the Old Testament, once he died, they had to get another high priest. And every year they had to, they had to slaughter an animal, right? Day of Atonement. Every year, not only did he have to slaughter the animal for himself because he was a sinner, but also for the children of Israel. Not with Christ. Christ has no sin. He's God in the flesh. And once he died, it was a perfect holy sacrifice once for all time and Christ is able to save to the uttermost never to die again it's a one time deal right and that's what he's saying here verse 9 knowing that Christ having been raised from the dead is never to die again death no longer is master over him he conquered the grave for the death that he died he died to sin once for all or you can say for all time but the life that he lives, he lives to God. And what kind of life does Jesus live right now? He's at the right hand of the Father, and he lives as our high priest, who is able to save to the uttermost. Verse 11. So now, here's the problem. We're not thinking right. And this is what Paul is, is trying to help us understand. We need to think right in this. That's what he's saying in verse 11. Consider yourself. You need to calculate this and believe this because God's word says it. We need to consider ourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Your old self is dead. Stop trying to resurrect the old self. You ever heard a person say, oh, that was the old me. Let them stay dead, buried, right? 
consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, here's a command, and this shows that our will is involved here. Do not let sin or stop letting sin control you. Because you have the, the power now by the Holy Spirit who lives in you. You're children of God. You can say no to sin. So when temptation comes knocking, you're like, I don't have to submit to that. I want to in your flesh. That's where you pray, Lord, help me. Change the desires of my heart, Lord. And confess those things to God. You know what? God sees that. He sees our struggle. And he wants to give us strength. And so we see here then, Paul says, do you not go on, verse 13, presenting your members or your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness? But present yourselves to God. We're children of God. We've been purchased with the precious blood of the Lamb. So present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments or even as weapons of righteousness to God. Why? Sin shall no longer be master over you. For you are no longer under law, but under grace. So not only is the power of sin broken, the penalty of sin bro is broken, but even the penalty of the law. Because if anyone breaks the law, guess what the penalty is? Death. We're no longer under that penalty. You know why? Because somebody has taken our capital punishment for us. Somebody took our capital punishment. You, you and I, when we're born, we were born on death row. You understand? We were born on death row. We were going to be punished for our sins, and it was a capital crime. But somebody told us, come out of that cell, and they took our place, and then they died in our place. The law no longer has jurisdiction, because once a person is dead, remember, the law is only for the living. Christ died. He died in our place. No longer has jurisdiction over us. We died in Christ. Really important. The Bible says, as you know, in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And it says, for we are his workmanship. What does that mean, workmanship? That means we are his works of art, created for good works. Isn't that amazing? We're created for good works. So let me ask you a question. How are you living your new life? If you have a new life, how are you living your new life? And here's a real good question we need to ask ourselves, okay? In all the things that we're doing, all our endeavors, what is it going to matter in 100 years from now? And all the things that we put our energy in, and time and sweat and blood, right? In a hundred years from now, is it going to matter? I tell you what it will matter when, when it involves souls, right? When you're sharing the gospel, when people are coming to Christ and you share the gospel with somebody and then they share it with their child, then share it with their child. I, I told you my grandfather was born in 1900. He would be 121 years old. Do you think he had an impact on me? Do you think he had an impact over 100 years ago? You know, you know it. So, beloved, I want you to understand this, to see things in perspective. What is it going to matter in 100 years from now? What you're putting all your time and energy in. So, beloved, understand, it's souls, it's people. So, how are you living your new life? How are you having an impact? How does it matter? Really important. Go back with me to Romans 7. And so we see then that, that we have been married and joined to Christ. And we see here that we are, we are born again for a reason that is to bear fruit. Look at verse 6. Romans chapter 7, verse 6. But now, he says... We have been released from the law. We're not under that, that covenant, right? Having died to that by which we were bound. So that we serve, and I like this, in newness of the spirit. And not in the oldness of the letter. 
And what is he talking about? That's regeneration, beloved. Regeneration. Remember, I told you that the legalists say, well, you know, you take away the law. You tell people you're no longer under law. Oh, they're going to go crazy. They're going to go sinning everywhere. There's nothing to restrain them. Ah, oh, but there is. What is it? A new heart. A new life. Go with me to Ezekiel. As Ezekiel is talking to the children of Israel about the new birth. Go with me to Ezekiel 36. If you can find Daniel, it's right before Daniel. One of the major prophets there. Ezekiel chapter 36. I want you to see how he describes a new birth. Ezekiel 36, verses 22 to 28. And he's talking about the day that Israel is going to be saved. Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 22. And I really want you to hone in on, on, on the new birth, what it looks like, and the way the Lord describes it here in Ezekiel. Ezekiel 36, starting in verse 22. Therefore, say to the house of Israel, he's talking to e Ezekiel, thus says the Lord God, is it... It is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I'm about to act. Because Israel, they did sin, they, they sinned greatly against the Lord. But God's name is to be glorified in and is to be holy. He says, But for my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations where you went, I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations which you have profaned in their midst. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God, when I prove myself holy among you in their sight. For I will take you from the nations, gather you from all the lands, and bring you into your own land. Then what's going to happen? I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. And I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Moreover, I will give you, what? A new heart and put a new spirit within you. What's that? That's the new birth, beloved. I will give you a new heart. And put a new spirit within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Verse 27, I will put my spirit within you and cause you, look at that, to walk in my statutes. And you will be careful to observe my ordinances. You see what God's going to do? Is God going to give them more laws? Is he going to give them more rules? No, he's going to give them a new heart, right? He's going to put his spirit. And that's what your regeneration looks like. When a person is born again, we have a new heart. We have a new love. We have a new life. And we want to obey the Lord because he's the love of our life. And I want to obey him. I want to please God. My old life is I want to please myself. It's all about me, myself, and I. I want to please myself, follow the desires of my heart, the desires of my eyes, to follow my flesh. That was my old self, but now I have a new heart, and the Spirit of God lives in me, and I want to please God. So I'm not following kind of like a list of rules. Yes, I'm obeying the Word of God, but I want to obey it. The God's commandments are not a burden to me because I want to do those things. So in the new birth, we receive a new heart and the indwelling Holy Spirit in us. And so, beloved, we are no longer, as he, as he said to these people, you're no longer under law. He says that to the Galatians and Galatians 5. Go with me there. Galatians 5. He's dealing with the same problem there. So let me ask you, do you have a new heart? Or you still have the same old heart? It's all about you, yourself. That's not what life is about, folks. God created you for himself. He made us for himself and is for his glory. Galatians chapter 5, look at verse 13. Galatians 5, 13. 
we are free from the law, the penalty of the law, right? The Mosaic law. For you have been called to freedom, Paul says, brethren, only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh. That's not what a new life looks like. But through love, serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. Verse 16, but I say walk in the spirit and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. That means an obedience to the word, doesn't it? For the flesh sets its desire against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. For these are in op opposition to one another so that you may not do the things that you please. You see, when it comes to the Christian life, you do what pleases God. You don't do what you please. You do what pleases God. And hopefully pleasing God is pleases you, right? Verse 18. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not, you are not under the law. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, are evident, which are what? Immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and the things like these of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you that those who practice such things, if that's your lifestyle, friend, you're not saved. Those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. If that's your, what your life looks like. But the fruit of the Spirit, and this has to do with, with attitude, doesn't it? The fruit of the Spirit is love. God's love, right? Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such, there is no law. That's a, that's a changed heart. That's a new creation. That's what it's talking about. Now, those who belong to Christ, what has happened to them? Have crucified the flesh. This is in the aorist tense, once for all time. They crucify that old self with his passions and desires. Now, understand, again, we can't say, well, well pastor, I'm saved, and I no longer have any problems with sin. <laughs> no. It will be around. It's still a strong force, and it's all around you. And it's always tempting you. That's why you got to be in the word, be in prayer, stay close to the Lord. And when you do slip and fall on your face, don't stay down. Confess right away. Right away. Confess right away. Get right with God. Get in that habit, right? Because many of us, we do this, right? We fall on our face like, well, I'm already down already. I might as well go all the way. <laughs> no. Get up right away. Dust yourself off, right? It's like when you fall off the horse, right? You stay in the you can stay in the mud. Some of us do. We wallow in the mud. No, you get up right away, clean yourself off, get right with God. Keep short accounts with the Lord. Confess right away. You know, it's like when you say something, you know, when you say something, you can't get it back. You say, and right in the middle of the sentence, you're like, oh, what did I say? <sighs> That's the way sin is, right? You're right in the middle of sin, like, oh. No, Lord, please help me out. Repent. Repent. Even, you know, as soon as you realize you're in the wrong, repent. You know what? God's going to bless you. Keep those short accounts with the Lord. And then you have those Judaizers who want to keep people kind of in the law. And you, you go with me to Colossians chapter 2, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. And in Colossians chapter 2, we see that Paul is dealing with these people who are legalists. And he says to them, look, don't, don't be bound by, by legalism. I mean, if something is very explicit in the scripture, then of course, this is the word of God. This is our final authority. Colossians chapter 2, look at verse 16. We learned that a lot of people were very legalistic and they were doing certain things and eating certain foods. And, 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 and Paul says, oh, be careful with that. And we know that's, Many times that came from the Judaizers with the Colossians. It was these people that were worshiping angels and uh, they're showing a, a type of religiousness. Colossians chapter 2, look at verse 16. Therefore, let, therefore, no one is to act as your judge. See that? 
in regard to food or drink or in respect to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day. What does that sound like? Judaizers. They want you to follow the law of Moses, right? Don't eat certain foods, right? Don't drink certain things. Keep the festivals. Keep the Sabbath day. Verse 17, things which are a mere shadow. See that? A which is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Remember, it all points to Christ. Christ is our Sabbath rest. All these things point to Christ. All these laws were given to set the people of God apart from other sinful people. And in Christ, we are set apart from the world. So the substance is Christ. And it goes on to say, let no one keep defrauding you of your prize by delighting in self-abasement and the worship of angels. That's kind of bizarre. Taking his stand on visions he has seen inflated without cause by his fleshly mind, verse 19, and not holding fast to the head for whom the entire body being supplied and held together by the joints and ligaments grows with a growth which is from God. If you have died, there it is again, and we have, by God's grace through faith, if you have died with Christ to the elementary principles of the world, why, as if you were living in the world, do you submit yourself to decrees such as do not touch, do not taste, do not, do not handle, right? I meant to say that one first, sorry. Which all refer to things destined to perish with use in accordance with the commandments and teachings of men. These are matters which, to be sure, the appearance of wisdom. Doesn't it sound like all oh, these people are wise? They, they have all these rules and regulations. Their appearance of wisdom in self-made religion and self-abasement and severe treatment of the body but, of, but are of no value against fleshly indulgences. Do you understand that? A lot of people, they, they, um, they're real careful on certain things over here, but then they indulge over here. You know why? Because the flesh is going to come out. What we need is a new heart. We need a new birth. But these people are just religious. And he's saying, don't submit to that. Look at chapter 3, verse 1. Therefore, you, you who are redeemed... If you have been raised up with Christ, and we have been, keep seeking the things above where Christ is. See it at the right hand of God. Christ needs to be everything to you, beloved. Your hope, your desire, your love, everything should be Christ. And knowing someday you will be with him forever. And so he says in verse 2, set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. So we see then that we have this new life, this new birth, this new heart, this indwelling spirit. And please remember that by... Works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. The law cannot save you. Good works cannot save you. Only Christ can save us. And that's by God's grace through faith. So let me ask you again, has God given you a new heart? Do you have a new heart? Or you got the same old heart? Is the Spirit of God living in you? Let me close with this. Real simple question, do you know the Lord? Do you know the Lord? Do you know why you exist? God made all things, and you know why he made all things? For his glory. That's why we exist, beloved. The problem is that every, every man, every woman has sinned against God. The problem is sin, right? When man, when the original man sinned against God, it separated him from God. Every man is, same, is in the same boat. Sin has separated us from God because God is holy and righteous and pure. 
every man alive, every man alive has sinned against God and has broken his commandments. As a result, you all know this, every single person deserves to be tried, convicted, and condemned. Isn't that true? Because we're all guilty, right? That's what we deserve. Every single person deserves to be sent to the lake of fire. Every single one of us. But praise God, there is mercy. This is what we truly deserve. But listen to Romans 5.8. Romans 5.8 says, But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God, in his great mercy and grace, sent his perfect divine son into this world 2,000 years ago. Christ died on the cross, didn't he? He died a substitutionary death for sinners. He was buried, and on the third day he rose again, conquering death, conquering the penalty of, of sin, or actually paying the penalty of sin. As a result um, of Christ's death, burial, and his resurrection, men today, they can be forgiven. They can be delivered. So let me ask you, have you been forgiven? Have you, you been delivered from the wrath to come? Only by faith in Christ can we be delivered. God commanded all men everywhere to repent and to trust in Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord. Have you done that? Have you confessed Christ as your Savior and Lord? I have. And I'm going to keep confessing Christ as my Savior until I see him again. Well, let's um, bow our heads in prayer and have Brother Steve come forward. Father, we're just so thankful for your word. Lord, we have been released from the law, and we have been joined to our Savior. We thank you so much. Not only is he our Savior, but he has a, made atonement for our sins. And now we are joined to him. We're so thankful, dear Father, for our Savior and our, our Lord and our God. And help us, Lord, that, that now that we would have a new heart and obey you with, with joy, because we love you so much, we want to see, we want to have, give you joy, dear Father. You've given us so much joy and peace and love uh, because of our Savior. And we ask now, Lord, that you would bless us and help us to live a new life, dear Father, and not go back to the old ways and the old person. We ask now your grace upon us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, we have some birthdays coming up this week. Uh, Miss Joy, she's usually here on Wednesday night and, and uh, Sunday nights. Also, Ed Bravos is this week. Last week, we had some of uh, Joe Ventura, and uh, we also missed Michael Ozunas. Where you at, brother? Is he right here? There you go. It was the 11th, so wish them all a happy birthday when you see them. Uh, Sunday evening, our pastor's preaching out of, the, out of the book of Acts, chapter 10, verses 1 through 23. God's chosen Cornelius. Come out and join us. Praise and prayer on Wednesday night, 6.30. We have a little devotional, and then we uh, take praise and prayer requests, and we break up into groups and pray over the, that list. have a lot to pray about, so come join us and do that, folks. We need a lot of more, a few more prayer warriors. We have a funeral service tomorrow for our brother Tommy Haas's mom, Vivian. Um, if you can attend that service, it's going to be at Palm Mortuary on uh, Eastern and Robindale from, at 2 p.m., so come out and, and support the Tommy Haas and his family if you can. Friday night Bible study, we start at 6.30, have a little uh, food and fellowship, then we come in here at 7 and have a, a Bible study. Our pastor uh, brings a Bible study to us. All are welcome. Nursery workers and eaters, for interested in participating in that ministry, um, see Rose Ozuna. We're also seeking volunteers to clean our church. And uh, for Thursday, Friday, Saturday, volunteers for cleaning. There's a sign-up sheet for that in the hallway. If you have any questions, you can ask, talk to Miss Elizabeth. We're also seeking uh, also tuition needed for our brother Mario. If you can help with that, that would be greatly appreciated. And online giving, just follow the prompts on your computer and you can donate to Faith Christian Fellowship. Prayer request, lift up our church, our pastor and, his, and the, our ministries, pastor and his family, replacing the trailer in the back, our parking lot, the needs of our church, our country, our military, our law enforcement, first responders, and the persecuted church. 
Anything else, Pastor? Okay. Let's all stand for prayer. I appreciate uh, your continued prayers for uh, Steve and Debbie. As you know, Debbie's been having some issues with her neck, and she's going to have an MRI on Tuesday, so we're trying to get to the bottom of it. And so just, just pray for them, if you remember them. Uh, she's dealing with a lot of pain. Numbers chapter 6, verse 24 says, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. Let's pray. Father, thank you that we can come together and we can come and be under your word. Oh, Lord, I pray that you help us to know that, Father, we have um, been purchased again, not with silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. Father, we just thank you so much for salvation. Thank you for purchasing us through our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we are yours. We belong to you. Help us, dear Father, that we would seek to honor you and the way we live and the way we uh, conduct our lives, we pray. Bless us now, Father, as we depart, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.